So that to appreciate the full ideological complexity of the Devonzel d'Avignon, it is important to recognize that in a very real way, it does have a kind of narrative, which is a narrative of choice. On a literal level, the narrative is a customer in a brothel being offered the choice of one of these five women. And here, the unresolved stylistic differences within the painting play a crucial role. For the so-called Iberian heads, here on the left, of the two central figures, sometimes characterized as crudely simplified, are in fact almost elegant in their simplicity and not especially threatening, um, especially in relation to the two so-called Africanized women on the right. Indeed, the painting rep I'm sorry, presents us not only with a range of styles, but also with a range of female assertiveness running from the coolly passive to the boldly aggressive. These differences are especially appropriate to the overt subject of the painting, which is that of a choice which entails options that might range from dominating the chosen woman, as with the two women at the center, by buying her and effacing her identity, and I purposely draw the parallel with the colonial experience of Europe and Africa, to recognizing her power, as with the two Africanized women at the right, who resist domina domination and commodification, along with our glances and along with our expectations of stylistic unity. If the Demoiselle d'Avignon remains to some degree unfinished, or at least unresolved, it is not only because it combines two polar opposites within Picasso's private mythology, virgin and whore, noble, savage, and disfiguring cannibal. It is also unresolved because its subject is in no small measure precisely that of artistic and cultural impasse. Which image of women to use, which, I'm sorry, to choose, which woman to choose, which style to choose, which culture to choose, and by extension, which Africa to choose. As I draw to the end, I want to consider something that's been a kind of a, a, a sub-theme in my whole talk, and that is the relationship between painting and sculpture. Because for artists who were primarily painters, even after, after African art was taxono taxonomically um, accessible. Making it formally accessible in their painting was still very difficult. And one of the things that one sees when one compares, for example, the Luba figure on the right-hand side with uh, classical Greek sculpture is that the Afri African sculpture generally involved new ways of conceiving form and space in which um, gravity is to some degree suspended, in which there is a very strong sense of symmetry, in which the invented planes and proportions of the human figure um, were more radical than they were in Cezanne. And the question was, how do you integrate such forms into a pictorial format? And this became one of the main challenges that Picasso had in the next few years. At the beginning, he, like Matisse and Durand, he carved. And in 1907, uh, he was carving these two pieces actually from the New Hebrides, but at that time this was all considered in a single category of La Negra. Um, and so that we have two things. We have him, on the one hand, using very specific references to African forms in isolated parts of a picture, but only in sculpture is he able, at this point, to really create a, a total unity. And in fact, when you look at some of his uh, sculptures, the, the one on the left, for example, which has a very Africanizing head, but if you look at the lower part of the body, it's very much like an academic pose, the weight on one leg, the other leg um, not bearing the weight. Only in pieces like the one on the right-hand side, which is a little doll that he made for the daughter of the of Van Dungen's, uh, he made for Don, Van Dungen's daughter, um, and only here is he able to sort of get, to get past that um, spatial impasse. And in fact, when you look at Picasso's sculptures that he carved in 1907, such as one on the left, which I'm here comparing to a Dogon figure, if you look at them carefully, you see that even here, you've got one leg bearing the weight, the other leg, leg relaxed. So he still has not gotten out of this kind of uh, classical formula. 
And in fact, this, I think, creates one of the big problems that he has in 19, late 19, 19, 8, of actually making the figures in his paintings fit into the space of the paintings. And it's not until paintings like uh, Three Women of 1908 um, that he begins to inscribe these figures into a, a new kind of space um, that is much more disembodied rather than having them freestanding uh, in an, an illusionistically deep space. And then by 1910 or so, um, he transformed the space in, a, in, a, in an extremely radical way. Um, and throughout this, I think the guiding, the spirit of African art is there as a guide. And in fact, in the Kahnweiler portrait, if you look carefully, you'll see that one of these New Hebrides figures, you see here's the head, the headdress, is actually in Kahnweiler. It's a kind of homage to um, the stylistic source. <clears throat> 